Soil fertility. Onions do best in well-drained, fertile loam. Yep, they sure do. Good luck with that, you know. I mean, a lot of us have pretty heavy clays. Some of us have sandy soils. Ideal soils we don't always have, you know. They'll do fine in silt soils too. But I mean, I literally was reading things saying you should not grow garlic in clay soil. Well, when I lived in Silo, I wouldn't have grown garlic if I didn't grow it in clay soil because that's all I had. You know, and I grew some darn good garlic. And yes, I had to pull off two sets of leaves to get down to wrappers that weren't stained with clay. But I only did that for the ones I was selling. I didn't have to do it for the ones I was eating, you know. Um, and yeah, I had to be sure that I mulched it well because otherwise, come springtime, that clay would bake hard and that garlic would get choked, you know. But you should mulch your, your garlic anyways, right? I mean, it's going to have weed competition and whatnot. So it's like, yeah, there's ideals. And those instructions are for people who are thinking about going. To, you probably shouldn't become a dedicated garlic grower on a large scale unless everybody within 50 miles has the same kind of clay and understands why you're charging the money you're charging, because you're going to work harder if you got that kind of clay. You know? So it's probably not a market crop for somebody in heavy clay, but it sure is a fine home crop, and you can sure do it. You know? And so what's one of the best ways to deal with clay? Grow cover crops. What do you do with your cover crops? Inoculate them. Inoculate them with rhizobia so that they make their own nitrogen, so that when you're worried about nitrogen, you're getting it. You know? And inoculate them with mycorrhizae so that they are making the mycorrhizae, which are putting those fine root nodules in there. And their mycorrhizae actually are making a glue, a glue called glomalin, right, that actually holds organic matter in a way similar to humus. So you're actually getting organic matter in the soil, and it's actually probably a little bit less stable than um, humus, so it's probably going to be more nitrogen slowly breaking down, but it's holding a lot of nitrogen, I mean carbon in the soil, and that carbon in the soil is what's going to remediate that clay. So cover crops, inoculate it, totally, you know. We have been experimenting with balanced minerals. Yeah, you want to make sure you have a good mineral balance, you know, and we have a great video, Dan Kitteridge describes and shows you really how to do a good job of making sure you've got the right balance of minerals. I spoke to this, and I guess I got to speak to it again because it's a different class, but um, I spoke to it in our um, applied biology too. I had somebody come up to me after he saw Dan Kitteridge and said, you know, I saw Dan Kitteridge in the same kind of packed room I saw Elaine Ingham. And Elaine Ingham said, you don't need to add anything but the biology, and everything is there for the plants. And Dan Kitteridge has this long list of stuff that you got to put in the soil. You know? And so what am I doing here? What I would say to that is I think Elaine is probably right once you get that perfect biology, but good luck with that, right? <laughs> You're not going to get perfect biology right away. That's a process of healing the soil, learning how to grow a, a great dynamic group of plants, you know? And so if you're not patient, which how many Americans are patient, right? You might want to balance your minerals once, but you sh if you have to keep doing it, you're probably doing something wrong, you know? But your, your soils are probably out of whack as far as minerals go because we haven't been doing a good job on that, you know? And getting it balanced once, doing a soil test, go online. Um, he does a better job than I do about figuring out exactly how much to use. I always recommend doing on the low end, not like going for the maximum amount because if you're doing everything else right, you shouldn't need the maximum amount. The Lane Ingham effect will start to kick in. But make sure you have enough of each mineral that you will get in that range of fine. You know, whatever they, the term they use on the test, but don't, don't be in the, in the deficient range because that's going to make it hard, you know. Um, and then I've been learning about John Nilsson about paramagnetic rock dust. And folks, I'm convinced. I mean, Jeremy put, he saw Dan Kitteridge and put a shovel full per hole for um, squash in the greenhouse last year. And that squash never fell over. You know how summer squash will get, start to get longer and longer and then kind of drop and start to run a little bit? Stayed tall, didn't fall over. And we didn't spray for vine borer. And we tend to get hit with all kinds of fungus in the greenhouse. They didn't even want to grow it in the greenhouse anymore, but I pointed out to them that, yes, it kind of looks like crap after about six weeks, but that's six weeks of squash that the hungry don't have because it's, it's May, and so we should grow it. Last year, with that rock dust, which I can't give any other reason why it was like that, but we didn't do science. We didn't grow a few without. 
So I can't prove it, right? But I don't need to. I'm a farmer, I'm not a scientist, right? It didn't, it didn't look ratty and need to be pulled till sometime towards the end of July. It kept going. This year, they had access to plenty of rock dust when they planted the garlic in this field here. And they didn't have as much over at the other um, farm, North Mills River Farm. And so they put in, not insignificant, but not nearly as much. They were generous here. That garlic is some of the nicest garlic I've ever seen. You know, so I think paramagnetic rock dust, what is paramagnetic rock dust? It's rock dust that has magnetic principles. You know? So you know, it's not, you're not going to get a magnet to stick to it because it's not that much, you know? but they make meters that can show it. Ferrous metal. Yeah. So where do you get it? It is somewhat paramagnetic if it's granite, which is what we can get locally. But basalt is, is higher. And um, John Nilsson has found a place he's not advertising. But we can, I, you know, I said, can you resupply me? I can sell it. And I was saying 75 cents a pound because of cost. But when I realized what that came to, I think like 50 cents a pound would cover our travel cost and the time of doing it. And I, you know, to experiment and see what you think and then create a market, I'm hoping that eventually John will start selling it, you know. And he'll make some money on it, but it'll still be like, you know, he'll be selling it for a couple hundred dollars a ton. And for what you can do with it, it'll be way worth it, you know. Um, but right now, if you're interested, you know, I don't have it here to sell, but, you know, if anybody wanted to, I could drive over to Grandview and, you know, we could find some sacks so you could take some home and play with it. And that's what I recommend. I'm not trying to get you to buy it. I don't want to make money. Um, I can't make money. I'm a nonprofit. But I want people to experience it. So I said, if I sell it off so people can experience it, you know, and I... You know, I almost always have an idea for the, grow, for the Sustainable Ag Conference. I couldn't think of one this year until I suddenly thought, we need to be talking about rock dust. So I'm going to be, didn't have time until next week, but I'm going to be writing to them and saying, we need to do a rock dust workshop. You know, and I'm happy to be the grower if you want me to be, but John should definitely be the main presenter. And he's like, I'm not giving up my source. It's like, you don't have to give up your source, you know. Um, get people turned on to it. They can figure out their own sources. Um, the good news is it's effective on any level. You know, somewhat paramagnetic is better than not paramagnetic. Rock dust alone is not bad, you know. But if it's paramagnetic, it's just about more energy. You know, it's, it's causing more energy to happen in, in all the interactions, you know. Um, and there's other, actually Michelle looked up because the kids were asking, and there's something about it actually making plants like reach, you know. For some reason, probably because of the, the play between what's magnetic and what's not, they tend to stand up. You know, which is not bad for a lot of crops. I mean, put enough in, maybe your corn won't lodge. Or lodge as much, or come back up, back up faster. I mean, that wouldn't be bad, you know? Um, anyway, I don't know, I would have had it on there if I hadn't looked at that garlic and thought, whoa, that stuff's looking good. You can take a look at it and see if you agree. Problems. Do a soil test, balance your minerals, grow cover crops, use compost. Don't use compost like you're trying to like feed your plants with it unless you're really good at making compost. And then you may still get in trouble because you might have too much phosphorus and too much potassium because they're high in it, you know? But use it to bring in the microbes. And when to apply it is when you're killing your cover crop. Till as little as possible. So what I would do is I would have a small amount of good compost. Yeah, it is there. And um, I would spread it right before I rolled my cover crop down so that I'm covering it so the UV rays are not killing the life. And what I want is the life. I want that life, which should be prime in your compost, to take advantage of the food I just gave it and to start to eat it and then also to start to fix it and humify it and get it stabilized in the soil. You know? um, and you know, I say till as little as possible. Don't not plant your alliums because you shouldn't till. You know? Right now, we blew it. We didn't get a machine we were supposed to get on time and we were counting on renting the machine. Our cover crops are a bust. Our fields are full of weeds. We're, we're disking our North River farm. We haven't done that since we bought it. You know, we dissed it once to get them established. We had like five years running them, just one cover crop after another, but we have to disk. And that's the case. You do sometimes have to do it because of conditions or whatever, but try to do it as little as possible. And we have a, at least one or two videos up there on different ways to do it at different sizes. Um, does anybody need more about why not to till, or is that all pretty well known by now? I mean, honestly, I know the reasons why. I just haven't learned techniques that would right. yeah, make right. it functional for me to do that. And the things that I'm experimenting with, I'm not happy with yet. Okay, so watch our videos and then email Lisa at lisa at livingwebfarms.org and say, I want to 
Zoom now, we switch to Zoom. I want to zoom in and do a, a day on the radio with Pat. And let's just talk about your techniques and see if we can brainstorm and figure it out. I don't have it figured out completely. And sometimes what I try doesn't work, but I'm having more success than not. You know? And I'm doing it all different ways. You know? um, sometimes with equipment, sometimes without equipment. Sometimes way labor intensive, sometimes pretty darn easy. But um, I'm just like pretty much on fire about the effect and about the impact for the world too. So I'm, I'm going to make myself learn how to do it. It's for sure not like, oh, I know how to do it now. But I'm getting better at it all the time. You know? And I'm happy to jam with you on it and see what we can figure out. You know? But everybody gets why we don't want to till, right? How would you grow garlic in a cover crop and have a no-till system? Okay. And actually use the mulch that you had from your cover crop to help in the aid of weeds. I've only got this figured out in theory. I'm hoping to implement it this year. But what I would do is I would grow cover crops, like I described, like bursine clover or barley that wouldn't get, at least they wouldn't get too rambunctious, right? Barley. I would, spring barley, rope, pardon? It's an oak, isn't it? it? It's a grain, so okay, no, you won't, you're right, you don't wanna do that with, with garlic, right, okay. Okay, so then I would do oilseed radish, um, Facilia tanacetifolia, um, the oilseed radish will die. The phacelia might not die, but it's not going to be real vigorous. So your garlic can get ahead of it. You, know? um, you might have to do a little bit of management in the perfect year for phacelia. But, and of course, there will be that year when I'll be sorry I said that. But by and large, it'll work. You know? And that's natural systems, right? I mean, nothing we do right, is going to always work. You know, that's the, I mean, this year, all kinds of didn't think, things didn't work because we had like two weeks of nonstop rain. And we're farming, right? We're not, we're not like in a lab. We don't control everything. But most years that would probably work. Um, I'd use those guys, but in the row where I'm planting, I would look at growing something that I know would winter kill or I know I could kill for sure. You know, Maybe fenugreek, the problem is we gotta figure out a way to get fenugreek priced down. Fenugreek is great because it definitely winters kills. It definitely has some hardiness. It is a legume. And so I see it as having a future, but so far, nobody's bringing it in where it's not very expensive. You know, no farmer is going to be able to do it. I might be able to do it experimentally to help create a market for it, you know. But um, maybe bursine clover. But see, that's not going to die soon enough. So what I might do instead is just grow summer cover crops and let them die, and probably not high residue because that's going to be too much work for planting. Probably things like buckwheat, cow peas. Determinant cow peas, because I don't want that mess like getting all over the place, you know? Things like Red Ripper. Those be in the strips where I'm planting the garlic. And then, so at the same time that I'm planting the garlic, right? Grow the whole bed, probably, to those guys, but only so where I'm not growing the garlic to the winter cover crop, which would be the things I described, you know? And then I think it could work. But I haven't tried that one yet. That's all just like theory. And I've been jamming on it a lot. I'm hoping to try it this year. Basically, I'm pretty determined. Cover crops, cover crops, cover crops all the time. I'm on a way to plant an acre of garlic and not have to touch any mulch. Yeah, that's gonna be, your path is gonna be high residue. The problem is the high residue crops we have, they're all grains. Maybe what you do is you gamble. Because the, the wheat curl mite is only a problem in drought years. I mean, we grow, we've been growing grains you know, I've been growing garlic here, or associated with growing garlic here, one way or another since 2007. I've had some involvement, some awareness of it at least. And only one year, the wheat curl might be a problem. Wheat curl might, not white. But yeah, I mean, and that was, you know, 2015, 16, when we had wicked drought and it went through the winter. You know, a couple of big, heavy, cold rains, they probably would have been suppressed. But if I knew about it, maybe I could have gone out there with soap and neem and knocked them way back so they were no more, you know, no more of a problem. But they're probably also a problem with storage, you know? So then you want to learn like what level is allowed and that's going to take involving extension, you know? And then they're going to probably say, just don't grow grains. And then you got to say, no, but I want to grow grains because I want to build the soil. So we drive extension crazy that way, right? I mean, you know, because we, we're insisting on life all the time. We're insisting on the hard way. And we have our reasons and they're good reasons, but it just makes more work for extension. I really appreciate that extension is learning to work with us. Extension is, it's a wonderful thing. I'm really grateful for it. And we're lucky we got a lot of great extension agents. You know, I got no complaints at all.
I think that basically is my fertility program for these things, you know. Just know that if you use herbicides, oh, a big mistake, which we make in our greenhouses sometimes, because people get busy, and they turn the irrigation off on beds that we're not using. Before, you know, they might, they might come in and get a cover crop in two, three weeks later. Letting that bed dry out big time, not a good thing. You know, if you're trying to work on a system that's dependent on life, you do not want to put that life through a wicked hard time, you know. So, you know, even if you're not using a bed, if you can, maybe you can't, maybe you don't have a water source, but if you can, some water, maybe not as much as you're giving your crops, but enough to maintain healthy life, way worth it, you know. And then there's nothing you can do if you get the water the other way, and that can do it too, you know. That's just farming, you know. And everybody that does it, every gardener, is an absolute hero. You're very brave, given the odds, you know. <laughs> it takes some courage. All right, problems. This year, Rhizoctonia, if I had taken the time, I could have shown you our damaged seedlings. I think it probably came in, as I mentioned, with the potting soil we were using, but I don't know for sure. Um, we actually oftentimes don't have a cover crop where we plant the onions because we're going out so early. It's hard to control it, so it's where we had the brassicas. It's heavily mulched, but we take the brassicas off. The thing is, brassicas should be, if enough residue is going in the soil, they should be su suppressing these kinds of diseases. Brassicas are suppressive to these soil rots. But I don't know how much went into the soil. Maybe, you know, maybe somebody came through and didn't like let the residue fall but cleaned it up. Um, you know, just because they wanted more material for compost or whatever, a worm box, I don't know. Uh, anyways, we had Rhizoctonia and it, it hurt a couple of beds. The later beds, the earlier beds were fine. Um, and that makes me suspect that I think that the, it came in with the potting soil, but I don't know for sure. The solution was pre-stop. Pre-stop is a new biofungicide. It's pricey, but it's pretty potent. Then again, who knows, maybe it stopped on its own. You know, once again, we did not do a control. We're farmers, we want to stop every bit of it. We're not going to let a little bit of it be there so we can see that it worked. But um, pre-stop is listed for a lot of things. I've used trichoderma on similar things and it's worked too. And then mycotrol is another one. All those are helpful that way. Compost tea also helps, it's just about competition. We don't have much of that problem and I think most organic growers that are paying attention to keeping the life of the soil up won't have much of a problem that way. We were actually kind of shocked to have that problem, it had never happened before. But it's because I did this class really, I mean that's absolutely why it happened. Fusarium, you know where I've had fusarium the most? It was actually on ramps. But it's everywhere, it can show up on onions. I've talked to other people that have had it. And the solution is similar to what I just talked about, various biofungicides. Good health is the number one thing. Trying to avoid those stressful situations, not letting it dry out. It's not like it's not here, it's around. You know, um, you're not gonna keep it out of your farm. But if you, you know, don't let it get going, you're in better shape. So if you see it, you wanna act to take it out. You know? And I didn't take the time, but usually if you go to like a Cornell site or something, I think we list the disease site for Cornell on our webpage. They show you these pictures, it's easier to ID, but of course, if you see something wrong, just take it to your extension agent too. They'll tell you pretty quick. You know, I actually thought this was probably gonna be Fusarium, but it turned out it was Rhizoctonia, which I was surprised at, because that's, that's usually not a disease in a diverse soil. But once in a while, it wasn't diverse enough or there was enough of a load coming in. The first solution is drainage, so raised beds help. We have raised beds. Didn't help enough. It wasn't even raining that much when we had it. You know, but that could be too. Stress, once again, if the soil's too dry, just like too wet, can be a problem. A really good compost-based potting soil, that'll do it. Also, what I didn't put on there, my old growing partner, Ruth Strenga, she learned from the, her mentor up in Michigan. If you think damping off diseases, which is what Rhizoctonia is, is gonna likely to be a problem, spray your seed flat after you've seeded it with fish emulsion. You're not trying to feed anything. The fish emulsion is gonna sit on the top and it's gonna mold. And that mold is suppressive to the Rhizoctonia. It's about competition, once again, you know. Something else is growing there, the Rhizoctonia can't compete, you know. For me, it hasn't been enough of a problem that I would worry about it. But it might be for you. Um, it was a problem this year, that's for sure. Onion maggot. I haven't seen much onion maggot, but it can be pretty devastating. Rotation really helps with that. You can cause yourself a problem if, let's say, you decide, oh, my onions are really weedy, and you come in, you're careless with a the hoe. They're finding it by smell, so if you go ahead and cut a bunch of onions, 
That's going to help to bring them around. So be careful, you know. You got to cultivate or you got to weed if you want onions. But don't be doing, don't create a lot of damage. That's kind of like a neon sign for the onion maggot. Pay attention if things are happening. Pull it up. You can usually see the damage is happening. You can even find a worm. And I think on a small scale, I would bet, I haven't tried it, but I would bet that using neem would work very well. Neem is pretty amazing. It's the only organic insecticide I know that we can use as a systemic, but it's not cheap to do. But then that's, you know, if you get it in systemically, then it's just going to take those guys out, you know. So for a small patch or for your treasured seed stock or whatever, it's probably an option. Beneficial nematodes, if you can get them to work, will totally control them. That is a tough row to hoe. You have to get the right water and the right temperature, but it's doable. And we talked about it a lot in applied biology, so just you know, check out that video. You can get the solution on that. You know, it's kind of hard um, dealing with them, but they they it's it's not one of those ones that you know goes away. If you got it, it's probably going to spread, so you probably do have to deal with it. So you might also find that it's only in a limited area, and then it's probably worth sacrificing those plants because there can be more than one generation. But probably not. They're probably going to be a fair amount in. So you probably have to deal with it another way. Um, how many people have had, has anybody had onion maggot? Good, yeah, you know, the truth is all of these diseases, I mention them, and I'm not mentioning a bunch of other ones because I've never seen them. <laughs> you know, we haven't seen much of them. They're not a big issue. This is the first time we've seen Rhizoctonia be any kind of an issue at all. Fusarium has never been an issue on our onions. You know, it's been an issue on some other things, but not onions. So, you know, and onion maggot hasn't been a problem here. You know, thrips, thrips have been a noticeable, but not beyond threshold. We've been able to still get a good yield despite the thrips. But we have taken action when we needed to. And indeed, our sprayer's down right now. If we get it back up, I'll probably hit it with a little bit of soap and nematodes on the beds, at least the beds that need to recover from all the other insults they've had, the nut sedge that we just got off, you know, the rhizoctonia and the rain, you know. Um, the bed that looks good, I probably won't bother, you know. Um, that's about it for problems. Has anybody had other problems with alliums they want to talk about? Wire worms. Wire worms, okay. Wire worms, nematodes would help with that. Diversity, soil diversity, getting your, um, having more plants out there that are bringing in more ground beetles and stuff, they're gonna help to control that. You know, so upping diversity is probably your best bet. You know, you can put trap crops out like potatoes in the soil and stuff and they'll go to that, pull it out and kill them, you know. But the truth is on any scale, forget it, you know. It's fine, once again, for your treasured seed stock, but it's not, you know. But nematodes will definitely do it, you know. And I'm not gonna, you know, I'll just say that pay attention to temperature and moisture. And we go into it at great length at the, in the other workshop. Moles, anybody worried about moles? Have they actually impacted your crop or just bothered you? They bother everything else, but not the garlic. Right. Now, they, I mean, I have literally had, you know, huge onions in beds that I could reach in, and those onions were growing around the tunnel. You know, they're sitting on top, and the roots are growing around it. It just doesn't seem to bother them. They're a problem for other things, you know, um, and everybody knows that it's not the moles that are eating the roots, you know, but the moles are making the tunnels for the guys that are eating the roots, so... It's an overall problem, and you know, I'm not going to spend time on it because it's not really germane to this. I don't think they're a problem for, for alliums. You know, in fact, alliums probably do somewhat chase them away, but obviously not very well if I had tunnels that were. You know. <laughs> so yeah, okay. So that's it. We're done with the problems. So this first one that talks about the wild garlic. So you, anything you never want to know about wild garlic is there. Anyway, I guess I'm not gonna be able to tell what they are now, except for Southern Exposures there. Gourmet Garlic was a great site. That's where I got all the different varieties and stuff. You know, it had lots of good information on it. Difference between shallots and onions, what that was best for was nutritional difference. They, of course, think that there's a big difference flavor-wise. I'm still, the jury's still out on that with me. But, um, you know, and indeed, I think they also were the one, though maybe not, I might not have copied that. The diversity of shallots is pretty astounding. I mean. Other countries, they're different shapes. There's all kinds of colors. There's just a huge diversity of them. Um, and some people say the only true shallot is the gray shallot. I mean, I'm not enough of, I'm not enough of an expert or a partisan to weigh in on that, you know? But it is an opinion that's out there. And then the site on Egyptian walking onions, she writes pretty nicely about stuff and she gives you a good sense 
I bet that a lot of people don't need to read it at all. You probably have a thorough understanding of it, but if you haven't yet been introduced to Egyptian walking onions, she'll get you comfortable with them. She'll help you to become friends with them.